next morning at the station. My fingers dance across the keyboard the next morning with a fresh dose of energy that seems to have hit me today, one I've been needing for a couple of months. Sleep had come easily last night and remained undisturbed until my alarm. There were no nightmares, no haunting memories, nothing at all except the bliss of deep, peaceful sleep. Enjoying the energized feeling, I lean back in my chair and lace my fingers together behind my head to take a deep breath. I inhale the scent of printer toner, air freshener, and a hint of stale coffee. It's the familiar scent of the station, even if not overly pleasant, first thing in the morning. Still, at least it wears off as the day goes on. Puffing away the comforting but intense remnants of the lingering aroma, I lean forward to start working again. But my focus is drawn up and through the glass window of my office that looks out onto the rest of the station as voices sound from the front desk. With only Douglas manning the reception, it's no surprise that the voices sound mostly confused. The moment I step through my office door, I can see what's going on. By the front desk stands a woman who looks in her early forties, with amber-brown skin and black hair feathered away from her face. She talks express expressively to Douglas, one hand flashing about in motion while the other holds the hand of a young boy, I assume is her son by the resemblance they share. The boy stares up at them wide-eyed, shifting his tiny sneakers against the hardwood floor. Or at least she's trying to talk to Douglas. The obvious language barrier is not helping either of them. Unsurprisingly, Douglas isn't exactly helping matters. He tugs at his bangs, an arm crossed over his chest as he hunches away from her in disinterest. I'm not sure what he's saying in return, but it sounds little more than just incoherent, lazy mumbling. Even though Wayhaven is primarily English-speaking, there are more than enough residents who speak other languages to warrant a good system of translators when needed. I move forward to intervene, knowing I... Yeah, I'm confident with languages and fluent in some. I've studied languages and I'm able to speak a few. I'm certainly confident I can handle this situation at least. The moment I move forward, Douglas catches sight of me and his face sags with relief. Oh, thank God, he says, rolling his eyes and gesturing to the woman. I have no idea what's going on. I think she's talking Spanish, but I don't understand that. I'm starting to wonder if he understands much at all. I'll handle it. I say, but Douglas is already moving back to the front desk before I even dismiss him. Clearing my throat, I begin speaking in fluent Spanish. I would have really liked it if the game had actually, you know, done it in Spanish. Just, you know, a couple of paragraphs here of Spanish. I mean, I don't speak Spanish, but, you know, it would have been fun. I'm Detective Langford. How can I help? Her shoulders slump in complete relief as she understands me. My name is Nicole Salinas, and this is my son, Max. The boy shifts behind his mother. Nicole goes on to explain about an intruder in her son's room. Max had told his mother the man appeared from nowhere and seemed to disappear into shadow. When his mother looked around, there was nothing but the closet, his mirror, and his toy chest. Hairs prickle on the back of my neck. A few months ago, I may not have believed those details so easily, but now, well, a man appearing and disappearing into thin air is exactly something I would expect from this new supernatural world I've been thrown into. Jeez, I, I really hope it's not the bogeyman. Shaking away the fort, I turn to the woman. We are going to call the translator, and then Officer Friedman will be able to take the full details of your case. Her words are obviously understood, as she nods. Afterwards, I will assign Officer Poname to visit your home and make a thorough inspection so that we can resolve this matter. She lets out a heavy sigh, and then her hands find mine, the skin of her fingers warm and soft. Thank you, Detective. I really thought no one would believe us, but I had to try. He's my son. I didn't know what else to do. I have to be sure it's nothing. Hmm. Yeah, we're nodding. After giving a professional nod, I gesture to the front desk with one hand and say in Spanish, Officer Friedman will see to you now. Nicole gives me a nod in return, then gathers up her son and moves to the front desk. She seems to have a much less tense air about her now that she'd had a moment ago. While they are busy filling in forms out of earshot, Douglas huffs out a long breath and looks at me from the front desk. If you're the one in charge, I don't get why I have to deal with this stuff too, he remarks, shaking his head with genuine disappointment. I only just stop myself from rolling my eyes. With a final puff of indignant breath, he plods back towards Nicole and yanks out his notepad in an annoyed sharp motion. I stare over the group of them, my mind already beginning to whirl with ideas and thoughts. With the supernatural arriving more frequently in Wayhaven, it's highly possible that they've begun to interact with the people of the town. But it's just how they decide to interact that has me concerned. Better to get Tina to work out if there's anything further or normal to this case first. 
After all, it may not be supernatural at all. Maybe it's just a shadow or a scared boy's imagination. Of I know, I now know about the supernatural, that doesn't mean every case is going to be linked with it. With that calming thought, I turn away and head towards the kitchen area, where I can already hear Tina's voice echoing about the station. As I get closer, it's apparent that Tina has managed to corner Verda into conversation as he was trying to make his cup of tea. There's a smile on his long lips, though. He's obviously enjoying her over-enthusiastic and overabundant discussion. And it really must be something exciting that they're talking about as Tina's voice has become as high-pitched as the whistle of a kettle. Are you on duty? I ask, glancing over Tina's outfit. She's dressed in a plain, pale blue Wayhaven PD t-shirt, her hair half falling out of her ponytail and bouncing around her face. It's quite a contrast to Verda, who is dressed in his usual attire of a crisp white shirt tucked into navy trousers, which have a crease down the front of them, but so sharp I'll worry about getting cut if I stand too close. Yeah, in a while, she says, waving at me. But more importantly, have you heard? I stare at her, Verda chuckling softly as he places a tea bag in his mug. The carnival's in town. She explains finally, hands flinging to the air and almost knocking over a selection of kitchen utensils. Uh, <laughs> carnival? Um. <laughs> Smile and say, oh, nice. <laughs> Leaning on the nearby kitchen counter. That's exactly the kind of response a carnival should get. Tina adds, shifting her weight from foot to foot in an excited kind of bounce. Verda sighs, but it's a gentle, amused sigh. Uh, they set up the clearing in the forest just past the cemetery, you know, Hollis Peak. I, or is that, uh, you, you can never tell. No, it's, it's definitely Tina. They set up in a clearing in the forest just past the cemetery, you know, Hollis Peak. Uh, I didn't see a permit application or I would have told you, I say to Tina. It most likely went straight to the mayor. Berta replies with a shrug. Uh, who cares? Tina says, rolling her eyes and stepping between us. It's the carnival. I'm definitely going after my shift tonight. What about you, Verda? Verda grabs up his tea to take a long sip, its tangy scent seeping out through the stream. Uh, the steam. I'm not exactly keen on places like that, but I doubt my kids would stop pestering me until I take them. Tina, obviously pleased with the response, swings around to me, then with a hopeful gleam in her eyes. And you? Hmm... Hmm. Well, <laughs> depends on how much time I get free. Oh, please, Tina scoffs. With how quiet things have been these past couple of months, I thought you'd be raring for something to fill your time. Well, we've got a very important case about a boy seeing a shadow. <laughs> Even if it is quiet, we still have work to do, Verda adds. I forgot about the poppy case as well. Tina deflates, her lips sagging at the corners. I suppose. Doesn't mean we won't get any time for it at all, though. She sounds more hopeful than anything else. Verda chuckles, patting her gently on the arm. I'm sure you will find time, even if the rest of us can't. I'm hoping someone will ask me to the carnival. Tina continues with a sigh. Carnival dates are very romantic. And you would know that how? I ask, keeping my, my tone light. She breaks into a smile. Well, in my imagination, I do. Douglas snickers from the front desk, so we all turn to face him. Bobby hasn't been around in a while. Maybe she'd be desperate enough to ask you. Tina retches. I'd rather eat shards of glass. Yep, I'd agree. Glad to hear it. Verda replies in a firm tone. She's bad news, just like what she reports. He then breaks into a smile. And who knows, if you're really lucky, Tina, then Officer Friedman might ask you instead. Douglas looks towards his mouth agape. Uh -huh. Laughter instantly envelops, envelops us. After seeing the front desk, which is no longer crowded with Nicole and her son, I realize I actually walked over here for a reason. Would you mind checking out a property, Tina? I ask. Douglas has the details. Shh. Ah, that's me. Never mind. Would you mind checking out a property, Tina? Douglas has the details. Sure. She replies, stretching out her arms and then clasping her fingers together to make them crack. I notice Verda shudder at the sound of it. But I'm not on duty yet, and I'm starving. You want to head to Haley's with me to get a bite? Verda makes to walk past us, then pauses. If you're not going to head out to Sanctif, then I was hoping I could borrow some piles from you. Ah, oh, well, sorry, Tina. We need, to, we need to give Verda a couple files. Inside my office. After saying goodbye to Tina, I head into my office with Verda. 
He takes the padded seat by the wall instead of the slightly threadbare one in front of my desk, which I figure is probably a good choice. As I move to my desk, a burst of sunlit filters in through the <laughs> sunlight filters in through the window and adds some color to the room. A small spider plant lighting up into a vibrant lime green as the light hits it. Were these the files you were after? I asked, grabbing the small pile off the end of my desk that I had sorted out a few days ago. He nods. Exactly. I move back towards him to hand them over. Guess I'll finally have time to sort out my paperwork properly now things are so quiet once again. Seems everyone in town has done a good job on collectively burying what happened with that killer. Hmm. <laughs> Nothing like collective amnesia to help get a town back to normal. Verda chuckles. It certainly seems to be helping, even if it's not the best solution to dealing with this whole thing. You can't really blame people, I say. Burying this kind of thing just helps people get back to life. I should know. But is it the best thing in the long run? He asks. I cock my head to one side at the worry tone to his voice. He shrugs, then leans back with the files balanced in his lap. Well, not someone who can comment, really. I'm no psychologist. Maybe this is the best way for a group of people to overcome lingering worries? If there's any lingering worries, I'm sure we'll be the first to know when they crop up. I reply, adding a likeness to the sudden serious conversation. He chuckles. Yes, I expect you're right. A bleep sounds from my computer, so I head back to take a seat at my desk. Whatever happens, Detective, you should know that I don't think anyone else could have handled that situation as well as you did. Verda continues. <laughs> Are you proud of me? I ask, giving a faux gasp. Do I get a gold star? Please say I get a gold star. Verda lets out a stifled laugh. <laughs> I'm afraid I used all, up all my gold stars on Tina. Well, that's just blatant favoritism, I reply, adding a smile to the words. Here, yeah, Unit Bravo is going to be staying in town too, Verda adds, his words drawn out longer than normal. My fingers tap against the keyboard a little harder. It's good to have their support. And from what Tina tells me, it sounds like you'll certainly be enjoying their... Verda sta stares at me from across the room, a smile playing at the corner of his mouth. Complete and full support, at least for one of them, it seems. My tapping stops altogether so that I can peer around my monitor at him. What is that supposed to mean? What did Tina say? Verda stands and shoves her hand into his pocket. Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, Detective. With an amused expression, he tucks the files under his free arm and turns to head out of my office. Turning to get back to my work, uh, back on with my work, I barely inch towards my pile of paperwork before my phone buzzes. I lift it to my ear without looking. Detective Langford? Hello, Jules. My mother says from the other end. Mom? I ask, the surprise seeping into my voice before I can stop it. Everything all right? Yes, everything is quite fine, she replies. We heard about the woman that came to the station this morning with her son. Really? That was fast. We like to be kept informed. My shoulders tense. Did you buck my office? No, she replies with a soft chuckle. We're connected to receive reports or notes filed on the station system. How is that any better than bugging? I ask. Because the mayor allowed it, and it is definitely better than bugging. Everything you put into the system is official. Therefore, it's fine, sort of. Maybe, a bit. <laughs> Your decision to put Officer Poe name on the case was a good move, she continues. I lower my head, trying to keep my voice from being overheard by anyone in the station. You think it might actually lead to something? We're not sure, she says. But you have a good in you have good instincts, and anything should be followed up on now with the increase in supernatural activity. But of course, if Officer Ponem should find something unusual, hmm. I have to allay her suspicions. Exactly, Rebecca says, seemingly pleased at the resoluteness of my reply. Rebecca takes a breath to speak again when another voice interrupts. Is that Jules? Bra asks in the background. A smile catches on my lips at the sound of her voice. Uh, you need me to go meet them? I can totally go do that. <laughs> I bet you could. Morgan's gravel tone adds to the conversation. Rebecca sighs. I'll speak to you later, Jules. We both hang up and I stare at my phone a while longer before eventually slipping it into my pocket, then getting on with work. A couple of days later in the evening at the station. The setting sun glimmers through my window and makes the steam rising from my mug seem to shine. It's slightly hypnotizing, 
at least more so than trudging through filed reports and work I've been over at least 50 times already. With only a few minutes left of my shift, I pick up the electronic tablet balanced on the edge of my desk and slide a finger over the screen. The report Tina had filed about Nicole's house didn't give many details. Switching on my lamp, I flinch away from the glare of white light for a second before glancing over the report again with bleary eyes. After a thorough sweep of the entire property, which Tina has noted in the comment section as being bloody huge and decorated like one of those home interior magazines, Tina found nothing to suggest there had been an intruder. Bolts and locks were secure on the doors as well as windows, and there was no evidence of a break-in or even any sign of an intruder having been in the boy's room. Still, Tina promised Nicole she would pop around again that night after visiting the carnival in order to double-check. So either it was just a nightmare, or something else is needed to explain what happened. The buzz of my alarm sounds the end of my shift. So these confusing thoughts will have to wait until tomorrow, after, hopefully, a decent night's sleep. After closing down my computer, locking up my office and grabbing my jacket, I head out into the station's foyer where I'm greeted by the night shift volunteer. Have a good night, detective, they say as I make my way past. Maybe you should check out the carnival. Their enthusiasm beats against my tired body. The carnival has been all anyone has talked about for the past two days. Everyone seems to have gone, except me of course. My intention to go or not has been outweighed by my needing to make up time for my absence, so I've been taking on a few extra shifts when I can. The closest I've gotten to the carnival is seeing a few flashing bright lights over the tops of the trees on the west side of town. Shaking away the fort, I say goodbye to the volunteer and head out into the evening air. Outside the station. Dusk has taken over Wayhaven outside. The street lights flicker, seeming unsure whether it's dark enough to warrant spending the light or whether it's still just bright enough for people to see their own way. The remaining natural light, which is filtering through the trees dotted at intervals down the street, has a silvery rather than golden hue to it now, but it's still a welcoming light and like the sharpness of winter. As a breeze blows past me, I can smell the earthy scent of spring hanging in the air from the forest that surrounds the town. Life must be blossoming in nature at this time of year. Something I wouldn't mind seeing. With that decided, I spin on my heel in order to take the scenic route home, then almost fall backwards in surprise at the figure st suddenly standing in front of me. Hurrah? I ask. She glances down at herself and pats her, hand over, her hands over her chest. Yep, it's definitely me. She says a teasing tone to the words. I let out a breath as a smile forms on my lips. Thank you for the confirmation. Anything for you, detective? She replies with a grin. What are you doing here? I ask. Were you waiting for me? Yeah, she says, the smile dropping. It took bloody ages. She then shuffles closer, leaning in to give a smile that makes her whole face light up. You're always worth the wait, though. Hmm. Uh... I let out a chuckle. That's likely not what you would have said if you'd had to wait all night for me. Sure I would have, she replies with confidence. Either that or I would have just come inside and dragged you away from work. My chuckle turns into a laugh. So where are we headed now that you're finally out of work? She asks. Headed? I ask. Yeah, she shrugs, but then the smile on her face falters. I mean, if you want to. I finished my patrol, so I thought it might be fun to hang out together, but you might have plans, so... I step closer to stop the sudden spew of rushed words. It's good, I'd like to hang out. She lights up into a grin again. And let's get going. I was on my way home, but I'd planned to take the scenic route. I gesture behind her at the barely visible trail that cuts through the buildings leading to the forest beyond. I'll go with you. We both take off down the path before turning where I'd pointed, walking between the painted buildings and into the beautiful wilderness. Evergreen trees line our way instead of buildings as we make it further into the forest, our feet snapping a few twigs which line the barely trodden path. Taking a deep breath, I let the scent of sap and leaves settle over me. A chorus of birds sing out a melody to fill the dusk as the light begins fading to pastel pink with flashes of vibrant orange. It's like we're in the middle of nowhere, Bora says, the statement just verging on the edge of complaint. I can't believe how much nature there is when it's so close to town. That is one of the beauties of Wayhaven. I reply. The town hasn't spread and taken over the surrounding forest and scenery too much. Looks like that nature wants to spread, though, Bara says suddenly, pointing ahead of us on the path. Uh oh. I stare at the fallen tree ahead of us, its sheer size blocking our path. It's not even like we could go around it with the density of bushes on either side. 
Ra moves forward, apparently undeterred, using the branches as footholds to clamber to the top with an agility I've only ever seen in cats. She stands on top of the tree with her hands on her hips and grins down at me. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I lean back a little to look up at her. The fading light adds a gentle glow to Farah's already soft, attractive features and I almost forget to talk for a moment. Eventually I fold my arms and give a smirk. If you glowed any more, your head's gonna get so big you're gonna topple off that tree. Oh please, Farah says, pouting her lips in disbelief. My ego is well contained with My ego is well contained within this marvel of a head. Let's hope so, I reply with a chuckle. And now, she says, jumping off the log and landing almost with ease. Unfortunately, the laces of her boots catch and she stumbles forward into me. We almost topple to the floor together, but I manage to keep my balance. I smile at her. What was that about your ego? She breaks into a laugh, stepping back to brush herself off, an awkward expression making her smile falter. We should probably work on getting you over this tree too. Glancing about the gloomy path, I spot a broken bit of the tree nearby. Here, help me with this. Ra doesn't really help once she realizes what I'm trying to do. Instead, she just picks up the solid log with little effort and places it down in front of the tree like a step. Thanks, I say, using the log to get me partway up so I can hopefully climb the rest. How big is this tree? No problem. Ra then makes her way up after me. At one point, my hands don't grip the twigs right and I manage to scrape my knee, letting out a hiss of pain. Apart from that, I make it up and over the other side without any further mishap. That tree must have had like a... a it must be like four or five meters thick. Jesus Christ. As the street lamps light our way instead of the sunset, our feet finally hit pavement once again. We continue walking together through an open alleyway each side lined with a dry stone wall instead of trees and bushes. I tuck my hands into my pockets as the warmth of spring hasn't made it all the way into the night. It's quiet here, Bara says, glancing about the alleyway. Not really your kind of scene? I ask. She shrugs in thought. Not always. I like the bustle of life, but in certain moments I can appreciate the quiet. And what moments would those be? Her gaze shifts over to meet mine. The ones I share with you. I'm glad. I reply without thinking. I like these moments too. Fra draws to a stop, staring at me for a long while before breaking into a grin so wide it makes her eyes crinkle. Oh my word, detective, you like me. What? I stumble on the word. She saunters a step closer, smile still firmly in place. You like me? Um... Hmm, <laughs> just walk away. Uh... I slide a step closer to her, her brows shooting up in surprise. I then place a smile on my own lips. Yes, I do. Ra's lips move as though she's trying to form a reply she can't think of. That wasn't what I was expect wasn't what I was expecting. She chuckles. That I would like you? I ask in confusion. No, she replies. I've been picking up on the, those vibes easily enough. I wasn't expecting the honesty. I lean back a little. I hope it didn't shock you. It surprised me. Most people aren't honest with their feelings in this world. She leans forward to close the gap, her hand moving to slide up my arm and brush against my neck. It's exciting that you are. It takes a moment, but I eventually manage to get my thoughts in order enough to form a reply. Well, at least until I feel a hand slide onto my shoulder, and I realize that the hand isn't for ours. <sighs> Bra gasps as her focus flashes to look over my shoulder, and she drags us both back to stumble away from whoever is behind us. I swing around, grabbing my gun from my holster on instinct. Suddenly I understand why Farrar reacted as she did. The stranger obviously isn't human. Their ears are long and frayed at the edges, looking like ruffles rather than skin. Two horns protrude from the top of their forehead, twisting back and curling into solid white ringlets that frame their face. And it's their face I suddenly can't look away from. Over half of it spreads a blue, grey and white mess which seems to be seeping beneath their clothing and into their hair like some kind of horrific face paint gone wrong. The swirl of colour looks swollen, white blisters forming in patches along the lengths of whatever is spreading over them. Where the mess has bled across one eye, the whole iris and pupil have turned grey and blank, and the eyes rimmed in red. They reach out a hand, long fingers ending in talons exhibiting the same spread of whatever is blistering over their skin. Help me. The supernatural splutters a cough, a dribble of white froth oozing from their mouth, a pained 
brown pinches what features I can still see on her face together into a tight knot. Please. They fall to the ground. What the? Bra begins, her words trailing off. She flicks her head to the side to stare wide at, wide eyed at me. Now what? Um, call for backup. I holster my gun in order to reach for my phone once I'm certain the supernatural isn't moving. We need to call for backup and get this under control. Under control? Bra asks, sticking out a hand towards the creature. What exactly do you need to get under control? They're not exactly causing a scene. But we don't know who might walk by, I say, glancing about the alleyway, thankful for the gloom which is keeping us obscured for now. How do you think a normal human might react if they stumble on this? Bra gives a half nod, obviously only now understanding the situation. Then who are you going to call? <laughs> I pause with my thumb hovering over the screen of my phone. She makes a good point. My first instinct would be the station and Tina, but in this situation that isn't possible. I have to call the agency, I reply finally. Okay, Bra says. I'll keep an eye on... She looks down at the sputtering supernatural with a grimace. Them. I sigh. All right, then we... Uh... Oh, it's gonna be Bobby. Detective. The familiar voice ricochets down the walls lining the alleyway and pierces through me. Detective Langford. I let out a tense sigh, pinching the bridge of my nose. Of all the people right now, why her? Next chapter.